Welcome back, my fellow watchers of the multiverse, and welcome to a brand new series on the channel, If I Had Written. In this series, we'll be exploring the exciting world of pop culture and using our imagination to envision what could have been if I had written some of the most highly anticipated projects that are yet to come from upcoming movies, TV shows, video games, and more, as well as canceled films and other projects. I'll be diving deep into what we know so far and using my creativity to come up with some thrilling possibilities for what could have been. So grab some popcorn because this is going to be a very long video. That being said, let's get in to if I had written Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. Peter found comfort in solitude. In solitude, there were no witnesses to who he truly was. Whether that identity was Spider-Man or Peter Parker, he wasn't sure. All he knew was that when he was alone, all that washed away, despite if it was just for a moment. A moment of silence was all he needed. Yet even in the quietest places, his mind was still so loud. The TV played in the background as Peter sank into the cushions of his sofa. The radio in the kitchen was on, interrupting the news broadcasts that had the same thing it always did. Spider-Man, the Red Menace, as many journalists were calling him. Some referred to him as a demon or a parasite. Then there were the channels that called him a misunderstood hero. Peter flipped through the stations and saw every broadcast. Half were in favor of Spider-Man, the other half weren't. There were footage of protesters. Some of that said protesters turned into riots that caused fires and injuries. If Spider-Man showed up to stop them, that'd only make things worse. They were protesting against Spider-Man's involvement in the crime around the city. They blamed him for the deaths of Eddie Brock and Harry. A wave of cold air brushed its way down Peter's arms. It was like the opposite of a spider sense. His senses were still reverting back inside of themselves, his eyes wavering in and out of focus as his grip on the side of the sofa tightened. His knuckles went pale, his body felt claustrophobic in the widest room in his house. His ears tuned into the radio, the static blocking out much of the noise. The static slowly faded away until Peter could feel his own pulse in his ears. That was when the radio said one thing, one name, Peter, and it was in Harry's voice. Peter managed to snap out of it, moisture glistering on his forehead. It dripped down the side of his face until it threatened to plob to the couch beneath him. Saliva clogged his mouth as he willed himself to stand and throw on his coat. Instead of dwelling on the past, as he was prone to do, Peter left his abode to instead meet up with Mary Jane. MJ and him were repairing their relationship. Peter was amazed it was working at all, but it was the only thing that took his mind off Harry. He needed to cherish it. It felt like it was all he had left. Peter took his time going to the mall. MJ said she'd meet him there at the cafe at the front of the mall. It was one of her favorite places. The atmosphere was perfect for her. The mall was bursting with life and energy. Yet that little cafe managed to still stay peaceful. Peter wished he could feel the same way. By the time Peter arrived at the mall, he winced from how bright it was. There were Christmas lights strung all over the entrance sign, the glass doors reflecting the moon's light that wasn't blocked by any clouds. It didn't help that every single ceiling light was on and turned up to the maximum brightness. If that was even possible, it could have been his senses acting up. But Peter wanted to leave the moment he stepped foot inside. The little cafe was hard to miss. It was on the left. The checkered floors leading up to the table placed outside of the shop. Peter's sneakers smeared mud on the otherwise clean and light floors. The janitors grumbling curses as they rushed to clean his mess. Peter approached the round tables with metal chairs, seeing the head full of deep scarlet locks that draped down her right shoulder. Her hands were folded together, the heel of her foot bouncing up and down from under her seat. Hey, he said to announce his presence. 
placing his hand by hers. Not to startle her. Ready to go? You're early, she replied, her lips tugging into a smile. She was wearing less makeup than usual. Her lips were all natural, and it seemed as though what little she did have on was smudged. The dark eyeshadow she chose rubbed against the side of her eyelids, making it appear as though the tops of her eyes had bags instead of the bottoms. Yeah, I thought I'd surprise you. MJ was happy to accept the offer, standing and not bothering to tug in her chair back in before leading the way. Peter had hopped forward in order to keep up with her. The two were trekking down the crowded mall, people bumping into them. Peter's hands slippery from the liquids coating his skin. More saliva built up inside of him. His throat burned with misery. Him almost sticking to the people around him thanks to the agony flooding through his veins. Here, MJ said, pulling him away from the giant mass of people. Instead, they went to one of the stores near the corner of the mall. It was secluded, but there was a line to get in. It was far from too small for everyone to fit inside without getting squished. It was a small business dedicated to handmade crafts, like hand-dyed t-shirts, custom soaps, and more. By the time it was their turn to enter, Peter didn't realize how silent he had become. MJ latched onto his elbow and guided him through the narrow pathways. The interior was dark, lit by dim lights propelled onto the walls instead of planted inside the ceilings. It seemed as though Peter stepped into a medieval castle instead of a small business. The rows upon rows of crafted varieties, from self-cared products to clothing. There was jewelry too, MJ taking her time to investigate. What do you want for Christmas? She asked, without taking her eyes off of a long necklace placed inside of a dark box, much too tiny for it. Oh, I don't know, more red threads, groceries, gas. Peter Parker needs gas? She asked, amusement lacing her words. I would never thought I'd see the day. Peter glanced around at the other customers. They were near the front of the store mobbing the register that only had two poor workers behind it. His eyes darted between the products until his figure halted. Even MJ felt it, her averting her gaze from the necklace to peek at him. Peter, she said. Her voice was as delicate as he remembered. She followed his stare until she saw it. Maybe a dozen feet away was a row of shirts with anti-Spider-Man text. Harry Osborne was murdered was one of the shirts, and Peter felt his tongue swell inside of his mouth. MJ was whispering sweet nothings to him that flew by his ears. He moved his eyes, MJ pulling him out of the shop as quickly as possible. He slipped his arms away from hers and fiddled with his fingers, scanning his eyes over the mall. There were varying stores around. Some had graphic t-shirts and hoodie designs. Others were more geared towards little girls with hair, accessories, and young fashion trends. However, no matter where he looked, there were posters, advertisements, and TV screens showing off random events. The one thing that caught his eye was the ad for Oscorp. Ever since the passing of Harry Osborn, Oscorp had gone insane with advertising. They were making it known that the company was moving on with the help of the new CEO, Roderick Kingsley. Oscorp, to keep a squeaky clean reputation, decided to stay neutral in the Spider-Man debate. The public was divided, half were on the side that Spider-Man was nothing but a murderer. The other half believed Spider-Man was justified in protecting the city. Even Peter didn't know which side to choose anymore. Are you okay? MJ asked from behind him, rubbing his shoulder as if that eased his heavy heart. I have to be. Peter replied, letting a smile grace his chapped lips. He licked them, but that didn't help. MJ signed and gave his cheek a quick peek, pulling him down the rows of the stores to continue their shopping. After graduating, Peter submitted an application to work alongside Dr. Connors at Oscorp. He'd find out their decision shortly. All that was left was waiting. His life could get better if he had gotten this job. Now. He had to stay strong, yet somehow, that felt like the hardest thing he ever had to do. Roderick found it. After searching for countless hours, 
Roderick Kingsley found what he had been searching for the entire time, the truth about Norman Osborn. Roderick had to dig through old computers and data archives the company had, but it led him to an old laboratory, thought to be abandoned. It was. But the items inside were still intact, preserved. Almost as if Norman had it here as a backup, in case something went wrong. Now, Roderick could use it. The serum Norman wrote about it in his countless lab reports and journals. However, Roderick noticed one thing was wrong with the serum. It wasn't perfect. The strength and speed could be enhanced, as with how much sanity was left after the serum was used. Roderick spent countless sleepless nights perfecting the design, using Norman's findings to craft the best version of it he could possibly create. By the time he was done, he gave himself the serum and let himself spiral down a well of emotions. Roderick scratched and clawed at his own skin as the serum burned through his veins, picking up and prouding at his blood as it shot through him. Roderick was on his knees. Heaves ripped themselves from his throat as the serum settled in its new home. He had a powerful serum coursing through his veins, not to mention his tech he was building in private. Soon enough, Roderick would become all he had ever dreamed of. All he had to do was wait. A few weeks after Mary Jane and Peter went Christmas shopping, Peter learned he was accepted to Oscorp, and he left the Daily Bugle thanks to that. He was approved, meaning he could work alongside Dr. Connors with no issues. Christmas Day was coming up soon, and Peter was so grateful he now had the job to make back what he spent on all of his presents for MJ. After everything that had happened, Peter felt obligated to spoil her this year. Peter wondered if the guilt and shame would ever disappear. The shame only built up inside his chest as he strolled down the blistering streets with the sun shining down on him. It felt like a spotlight as he walked under it. The crowds bumping into each other. Peter heard shouts up ahead. He wasn't sure when he saw protesters telling police to arrest Spider-Man for his crimes against the people. There were other civilians getting up in the faces of the protesters, claiming Spider-Man did nothing wrong, and people like the protesters were the reason why Spider-Man didn't reveal his identity. Peter chose to keep his head down and look the other way. He made his way to Oscorp as quickly as he could, but he saw more signs, more propaganda, more t-shirts claiming Spider-Man was a murderer and nothing more. His lungs collapsed in on themselves, the world feeling blurry. Still, Peter managed to push through and get to his job on time. Yet by the time he got to Dr. Connors to speak with him, he realized he was still out of breath. Despite his powerful abilities, Peter Dr. Connors said, greeting him in with a smile that stretched his face. His eyes were glistering under the lights planted inside of the ceilings of the laboratory. The space itself was large, a circular room with pristine flooring. Peter was sure his shoes were smearing with dirt on it. He sunk his head, pitter-pattering his way over to Dr. Connors to stand by his side. He mimicked the man's smile hoping it was enough to apologize for the mess he had caused. Something on your mind, Parker asked, monitoring to the clipboard resting in Dr. Connors' hands. Dr. Connors went over the nearest desk as lab assistants rushed around, moving equipment between the main room and the storage room, attached to the back of the area. There was a corner out of eyesight that Peter and Dr. Connors used to store all the necessary equipment for their research. Peter's first project was studying an unidentified chemical, a serum, really. I've been dishonest with you, Peter, Dr. Connors said, keeping his voice down. As soon as the last assistant went inside the storage room, Dr. Connors shifted his entire head towards Peter, some of his locks curtaining his wrinkled face. What have you been studying? It isn't some chemical, it's a serum. That's right, it's a test. Mr. Kingsley is sick, Pete. He needs a cure as soon as possible, and we're the best chance he's got. Why me? Peter asked before he could stop himself. You're impressive. You know more about this stuff than we thought. 
Dr. Connor still had a smile that eased Peter's nerves, but it wasn't enough to stop Peter's hands from trembling. You're putting his cure in my hands. Our, Dr. Connors corrected, giving Peter's shoulder a small squeeze. We're not doing this alone. We're doing it together. The serum needs to be modified, reverse engineered into a cure. Can you help me do that? I can, Peter managed to reply. But the words sounded weak as they left his lips. We'll need time. This isn't something that can happen overnight. I know. I'll see if I can buy as much time as possible. Peter went back to work. After that, studying the serum and seeing if there was a way to stop it. It was odd, really. It seemed strangely familiar to Peter, like he had seen it a dozen times before. Yet no answer came. He was stuck on the same equations, jotting down the same notes over and over until he was sure he'd lose his sanity. Eventually, after sitting at his desk for quite some time, Peter noticed Dr. Connors approaching him again. He let his rolling chair move back, their eyes locking. Dr. Connors brought his voice to a whisper. We're not getting much time. I just got off the phone with him. He wants it as soon as possible. Pete, he'll fire me if we don't get a cure for him quickly. My family needs this job. I can't afford to lose it. Then, it's a good thing you won't, Peter replied, grabbing another blank notebook. Consider it done. Whatever time frame we're working on, we'll manage. Nothing bad will happen to you or your family, I promise. Dr. Connors had the same comforting smile on his face, a small sign passing his chapped lips. He pushed up his glasses to hide the bags under his eyes. Thank you. I can't tell you how much this means to me. If it means a lot to you, it means a lot to me too. Don't worry. We'll figure this out. I promise. The word promise slipped by his tongue before he could stop it, but it was too late to put it back in. Dr. Connors gave Peter's shoulder one last squeeze before getting up and walking away. Peter watched him go, his calmly hands resting on his desk. He had a time limit now. It was either finish the cure as quickly as possible, or lose his job, or even worse. Dr. Connors would lose his job and the ability to provide for his family. Peter wasn't sure if he could handle the pressure. So many had relied on him before, but he ended up failing them too. He heard Harry's voice in the back of his head, but he pushed it down instead, returning to his work. No matter what happened, Peter would succeed. He had no idea what he'd do if he didn't. Peter was still Spider-Man. Although so much had happened in such a short period of time, Peter found solace in the fact that he could put on the red suit and flip through the city. He had just taken down his fifth criminal of the night, a man who tried to steal a woman's purse. The fourth was a drug dealer in an alleyway. The third was a bike thief. The second was trying to stop an armed robber at a grocery store. The first was walking around exposed. It seemed as though Spider-Man would never catch a break. Especially tonight. It was a bruiser than usual. It was crime after crime after crime. All Peter wanted to do was sit and breathe. But as he watched the police cruisers escort the thief away, he realized there was no break for him. So, he attached a web to the side of an apartment complex and swung away. The city was just as beautiful as ever. Despite the crime, the night sky illuminated the different colors that blended together in Peter's enhanced vision. There was navy blue from the sky, whites from the glass of the skyscrapers, and crimsons from the brick of the countless apartment complexes littering the city. Peter's ears were clogged by traffic, honks from cars filling the air along with the smell of overcooked hot dogs with too much cheese and chili splattered on top. Spider-Man landed on the roof of one of the complexes. He was swinging by. It gave him a moment to catch his breath, but he still got the chance to scan over the busy streets. There were civilians everywhere, making it difficult to distinguish them from each other. Peter crouched and peered over the crowds, searching for suspicious activity. He made sure to take his time. One minute turned into five. It seemed as though everything was normal, until it wasn't. There was a scream that pierced Peter's mind, his body trembling as he launched into action. 
he swung to the ground and landed on his feet. The people frantically rushing in several different directions. Peter went towards the middle of the civilians with his webs on the ready. Peter directed the innocent away from the scene of the crime. Some of them wore the anti-Spider-Man propaganda, but they were too distraught to make a comment on Spider-Man's appearance. By the time Peter got to the center of it all, he stiffened. There was an armed man there with a mask, covering his face. Gloves hugged his hands, thick cloths covering him, so Spider-Man couldn't even attempt to identify the criminal. Although he was wearing layers, Spider-Man could still make out the Harry Osborne was murdered shirt, resting on the man's chest. A handgun was in the stranger's grasp as he pointed it at Spider-Man. The hairs on Peter's arm shot up and rubbed against the fabric of his suit. He wasn't sure if he should attack or attempt to talk the man down. Seeing as he hadn't harmed anyone yet, Peter chose to act now, talk later. Spider-Man sprung into action. He leaped with his webs, preparing to fire. The man fired first. Bullets danced their way to Spider-Man's body. He twisted and turned to dodge. But that was the worst mistake he could ever make. Although Spider-Man did his best to clear the area, a civilian was still hit by the bullet. He dodged. Tears burned Peter's eyes as he snapped his head back to watch the innocent fall. The innocent man's hand hit the ground, his dark locks draping over his face as the life drained from his pale eyes. The killer took the opportunity to flee. He ran from Spider-Man who rushed into action. Adrenaline infected Peter's veins until he went faster than he had ever gone in his life. The killer stood no chance. He went down an alleyway between two complexes, this time no way around. The gravel of the alley hit Peter's feet as he ran after the man. It was a dead end. There was nowhere the killer could go except back. The man slammed into a dumpster and almost fell, the weapon wobbling in his hand as he turned back to aim it at Spider-Man. Behind the mask, Peter could see the eyes of a terrified criminal, yet it didn't change that he was just that, a criminal. Peter had a clear shot. He used his webs to disarm the man, snatching the pistol and unloading it. He threw it to the ground behind him before staring at the man, wait. Peter recognized that expression, those eyes, the color of them. He even recognized the shape of the man's figure. Without hesitation, Peter webbed the man up to the brick wall and came closer to get a better look. He unmasked the man, revealing Dennis Carradine. Peter couldn't move. His entire body refused to move. A single inch as he took in the sight, it was impossible. The man fell from too far of a height to survive. There was no way Dennis Carradine was still alive, yet here he was, right in front of Spider-Man. Based on the man's attire, Peter guessed he was looking for Spider-Man. He was trying to draw him out. It worked. Spider-Man was before him, staring down the one he thought he killed in his quest for revenge. There were too many words to say, but so little at the same time. Peter's mouth bobbed up and shot. As images of his uncle plagued his mind, he heard his uncle's voice. He heard the advice he had been given before. This time, the advice felt hollow, like an empty promise. In the heat of all of it, Peter took off his mask. Dennis and Peter locked eyes, and the world fell away for a beat. It was silent. All Peter could smell was gunpowder and sweat, and all his eyes saw were the tears that threatened to spill. Right when he thought nothing would happen, Dennis winced. Then, he coughed. The cough was followed by more wincing and groaning, the man's face contorting with agony. Peter backed away and managed to snap back to reality, throwing his mask back on and calling for help. Although his hands were shuddering and his feet barely moved, Peter found help. The man Peter thought was dead was rushed to the hospital to get treatment for his heart attack. Yet all Peter could do was swing away. The hospital was lonely, with the suit and his mask on. Peter visited Dennis. He would live, but he wasn't conscious yet. The doctors were still trying to get to the bottom of what had happened, but Peter guessed it had something to do with the man's fear for his life. Peter felt it too, but
but not nearly as intensely as Dennis did. Peter was outside of the room, silent. Dennis would get arrested for killing an innocent woman, although Peter thought he should be the one on trial instead. He was the one who caused the man's death. Dennis may have pulled the trigger, but Spider-Man dodged it. The man was only hit because of Spider-Man's actions. Maybe the court should be more focused on him. The hallways were empty as he backed away from the door. Dennis was on a bed, passed out, with countless tubes and machinery hooked up to his body. There was a nurse in the room to make sure his vitals were good. Seeing as Dennis was stable, Peter saw no reason to stay. Peter transversed the pale corridors of the hospital. There were fake plants and benches, flickering bright lights in the ceiling. Doctors rushed around, people bit their nails while waiting, and patients were being discharged. It was busy. Peter made sure to leave as soon as possible. He received many stares on his way out. He got cursed at twice. There were others that looked at him with sympathy. But seeing as it was a hospital, most were too caught up with their emotions to consider it. Peter understood. He felt what they were feeling. Not as bad. But his heart was contracting in on itself more and more with every step he took. By the time he got outside, the stale air hit the fabric of his mask. He smelled cigarette smoke, but saw no smoke. There were ambulances outside, some people waiting to get in, and, most importantly, there were police officers with their badges, out and shining in the moonlight. Before Peter could move away from the entrance to the hospital, the officers approached him. Peter was frozen, pulling on his mask to ensure it was secure before he cleared his throat. Can I help you? Officers, he asked, his voice cracking, despite him begging it not to. You're under arrest, was the only response he received. The group of four officers had their hands on the butts of their handguns, one of them pulling out handcuffs. They informed him he was under arrest thanks to Harry's death, and quite frankly, a thousand other things that could be pinned on Spider-Man, like the death of the innocent man who died because Spider-Man had to dodge a bullet. Although deep down Peter agreed with what the officers were saying, he still found himself latching his webs to the side of the hospital as he swung away. There were shouts as he fled the facility. The officers chased after him, and even from up in the sky. Peter could tell that they were calling for backup. As much as Spider-Man was fast, he was easy to spot. He was a man swinging through open sky in a bright red suit. Even if the police couldn't keep up with him, he was sure that the civilians would spot him and tip off the police. That wasn't a thought Peter wanted to indulge, so he pushed it aside as he left the hospital. The buildings cramped him inside the walls of his own mind. As he navigated the city, he went to the last place he felt safe, Ben's grave. Spider-Man landed in the graveyard. It went silent. No one was around except him and his thoughts. There was a bright breeze that brushed by and tickled him as he kneeled before Ben's grave. The headstone was covered in dirt that Peter wiped off with his gloved hand. He stuck to the stone for a second longer than needed. I don't know what to do, Peter said, keeping his voice hushed as the wind circled around him. Soon enough, the wind became snow. Little flakes trickled down and landed on his figure. As he leaned closer to his uncle's headstone, I could really use your help right now, he whispered, his voice stuttering over itself for a beat. He caught his breath as the snow picked up. All he did was kneel there, running a million thoughts through his mind over and over again until it felt as though time meant nothing. By the time he came back to reality, the snow became more like a storm. The wind picked up, Spider-Man shuddering from the sudden blast of cold. Despite that, he still stayed. He kept himself planted in front of Uncle Ben's grave. He had to go back to MJ, but it was like he was frozen. Then Peter stiffened, his mind tingling, the hairs on his body sharpening and alerting him to the presence nearby. He heard the crunches of footsteps on the ground, leaving dents in the incoming snow. His head snapped up as he shifted around and stood. He heard distant sirens, distant voices. One of them sounded eerily familiar, and that's when it clicked in. Captain Stacy was here. From behind the trees, the police appeared. They had him surrounded. It seemed as though his theory was correct. 
It was easy to spot him, even in a storm. Peter wondered if turning himself in was a good idea, but the serum popped into his mind. He couldn't let Dr. Connors down. He could suffer for his actions later, but if he went down now, that meant more suffering would come. Dr. Connors would lose everything. Make this easy for us, Captain Stacy said, as he approached, aiming his handgun at Peter. Although Peter had his hands raised, he knew there was no convincing them to lower their weapons. There were a thousand apologies Peter wanted to make. Instead, he turned and fled. His superior speed and agility allowed him to get the jump on them. As the gunshots rang out, Peter was covered in the snow as he darted through the trees to throw them off, the shots coming dangerously close to his body. He managed to escape, but barely. He attached himself to the skyscrapers and went so high that no one would be able to hit him from that range. It seemed as though the officers gave up this time, which Peter was grateful for. One instinct, he went back to his apartment with MJ. But when he entered through the window, Mary Jane always kept it unlocked. He noticed their bedroom was too quiet. The bed was made, the lights were off, and the floor was clean. No clothes were thrown anywhere, no books on the mattress, and not even any water on the nightstand. Peter took it upon himself to change out of his spider suit and into his casual clothes. He went into their living room, hearing the TV as he approached. The tan carpets sucked in his bare feet as he came out, passing the kitchen that was as clean as the bedroom. That was when he saw the redhead on the couch, spiraled across it with her hair flying in several directions. The news was playing on the small screen. It was the same thing as always. Spider-Man's face everywhere, police calling for Spider-Man to come out. Then, after a few seconds of lurking, the report switched to tonight's attack and the two people who were impacted, Dennis and an important civilian. Peter wished he could look away, but his eyes were glued to the screen as the report played out. Dennis was okay, but the civilian was gone, dead, and the people blamed Spider-Man which was no surprise to Peter. The police begged Spider-Man to come to a court hearing. They set up a date and a time and everything. Why were they publicly announcing a court hearing was beyond him. But then it occurred to him to that every time they tried to talk to him, so far all he did was run away. It seemed as though they were out of options. Right when Peter was about to announce his presence to MJ, his body stopped. The innocent civilian had been identified. It wasn't just any civilian, it was Roderick Kingsley's brother. Peter staggered back and banged his elbow against the kitchen counter behind him. Their apartment was small enough that all the rooms were connected, including the kitchen by his side, as he almost went trembling into it. Peter, MJ said, turning her head to lock eyes with him. He was hyperventilating. It seemed as though all he knew and had valued was crumbling before his very eyes and there was nothing he could do to stop it. Every time he tried to make things right, he only made them worse. First with Harry, then with Dennis, and now this. Trying to flee to help Dr. Connors only to learn that Roderick had bigger worries than the serum now. It was all Spider-Man's fault. I'm sorry, this is all my fault, he said. Through his tears, MJ was on her feet, rushing over to him to embrace him. He barely felt it. All he felt was the remorse that crushed his heart, more and more every time that he breathed. Roderick was furious. A few days after learning of his brother's demise, he was at a press conference, ready to reveal a new Oscorp flight suit. Although his body was deteriorating and his voice was lower than it had been before, Roderick had his sights on one person and one person alone, Spider-Man. Roderick pulled strings he signed contracts, he blackmailed where he found it necessary. His brother was the only thing he had left after the world had already denied him so much. His brother was the last piece of his family he had left. And now Spider-Man had taken that too. Spider-Man had already stolen so much from Oscorp. Oscorp had been in flames. Now, it was Roderick's turn to destroy Spider-Man's life. Roderick was tired of watching the public, no matter how small of a percentage of them, defended the man who pretended to be a hero. That hero caused people to die. 
that Hero brought out more supervillains. Roderick was sick on the inside and out, but he knew fiction from reality, and what he knew was that Spider-Man was living in a delusion that he could do whatever he wanted and to get away with it. No superhero should have that power. Roderick didn't care that he would be the executioner. Justice had to be served. The courts would give Spider-Man nothing but love, but since he was the only one protecting the city, if the courts were unbiased, they would see more villains were brought out by the masked menace. Why couldn't anyone see what Roderick did? That's what led Roderick to signing contracts and pulling strings as he showed off the flight suit with a crowd of clamoring people cheering him on. He knew in the back of his mind that the flight suits wouldn't be used for protecting the world. First, it had to destroy Spider-Man. The New York governor gave him permission to use the flight suit outside for testing as long as it was away from civilians. Since Spider-Man was on the run, they needed someone else to step up in case crime went beyond the police control. That's where Roderick came in. He was supposed to help with the crime, but in reality, he would help put Spider-Man in the ground permanently. Part of him didn't even care about the consequences. It felt like he was dying anyway, so why bother with consequences? Roderick was finished with his demonstration, leaving the stage with bright lights and flashing cameras. His subordinates applaud as he abandoned the flight suit, and he had a metal plating too tight for Roderick's liking. He ordered that it got loosened. It was strange how tight it had become. Just two days ago, it fit perfectly. Roderick left his subordinates to instead flee into the shadows. He went back to Oscorp and into his office, not bothering to answer any of his calls or emails. He was groaning as his head throbbed. It seemed like his vision was fading in and out of focus as he reached for his phone, putting it against his ears and dialing the familiar number before he could stop himself. Yes, sir, Dr. Connors asked. On the other side of the line, tonight, I need the cure tonight. Don't make me ask again. I've waited long enough. Now, it's gone on long enough. Get me what I asked for, or you know what will happen to you. Without waiting for a response, Roderick hung up and tossed his phone, not caring where it went. He held his head and his skin became more pale than it had been before. If anything, his skin appeared like mold. It was turning a light green that sprinkled in the dim lighting of his windowless office. He leaned back in his chair and tried to calm down, but the picture of his brother on his desk had him clenching his jaw and digging his fingernails into his palm. He needed to find Spider-Man. He needed to kill him. The snow covered the ground as Spider-Man made his way to the courthouse. Today was the court hearing the police were screaming about. They put it on every screen in New York. Thanks to that, there were hundreds of people waiting outside. Maybe thousands. Peter didn't have the energy to check. He had to get this over with so he could help Dr. Connors. He had called Peter earlier and asked for his help with the serum, and Peter agreed to meet at around 8 p.m. It was an hour after the court hearing, so Peter hoped it would be enough time since it was due tonight. It wasn't like they had any other options. Spider-Man went down the cracked sidewalk leading up to the courthouse. The brick walls of the building seemed intimidating, despite how he had climbed there many times before. Reporters were on either side of the sidewalk, leading up to the wooden double doors. They were already open, as if awaiting Spider-Man's arrival. He accepted the gesture and entered freezing upon noticing how empty it was. It was only the one judge, staring him down as if daring him to speak. It was his only chance to defend himself. He didn't need a lawyer or a full process, just a few minutes to explain his actions and why they were justified. He had never killed anyone in cold blood. Although he had made mistakes and regretted them dearly, he never broke any laws. Peter suffered consequences in other areas. What good would punishing him legally do other than rid the city of a protector? Spider-Man, the judge said, her voice surprisingly gentle. He heard the chatter from outside, noticing how there were cameras set up to capture his every move. Journalists were by the cameras, but no one else was allowed inside. 
No public. Just then. I didn't kill Harry. I didn't kill that civilian. I didn't kill anyone, Spider-Man said, straightening his shoulders as if that'd get his point across. I've done terrible things, I won't lie. Terrible things like what? The judge asked. But the tone wasn't an accusation. It was a genuine concern, as if she wanted to see the inside of his mind. It had Peter's lips tilting into a soft smile. As he took a step back, he was amazed that they hadn't asked him to remove his mask, but he took it as a sign that he had at least had somewhat of an edge in this battle. I let anger consume me. It fed up inside me until I hunted down a man to get revenge for someone's death. Someone close to me, just because I was suffering, didn't give me the right to inflict it on others, and I'm sorry for that. He may have been a criminal, but he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve to face my wrath. Peter paused, sucking in a breath and praying his fears wouldn't fall. Harry died protecting me. I hurt him so badly in the past, but he still sacrificed himself to save me, and I watched him get stabbed right in front of me. I watched as he was thrown away from me. All I could do is watch as my friend lost his life. Harry Osborne was murdered, just not by me, by Venom. But Venom's gone now, and how many villains appeared? How many of them did I handle? I regret not being able to save all of them, but I want to keep this city safe. That's all I've ever wanted to do. That citizen's death was a complete accident, and I'm so sorry. I know sorry doesn't make up for it, but I hope the family can someday forgive me. That man was caught in the crossfire. If I was just a little faster, a little smarter, maybe he'd still be alive. For whatever it's worth, I don't think you've done anything wrong. I would say, not guilty. The judge said, even the journalist seemed surprised by that. You once stopped a train and saved countless lives. The judge stood, as she said it, letting her gown drape down her body. She offered him a grin. I was there. She was there. She saw his face. Peter couldn't believe he was standing across from somebody who knew his identity. Maybe that was why she hadn't asked him to remove his mask. It was something she hadn't seen before. It had his heart jumping between his head and his feet as he processed the information. However, he didn't have the time to process it. As soon as the words clicked in his head, the pillars surrounding the area began cracking. Every crack brought the courthouse down more and more. Spider-Man shouted and leaped after the judge who was right in the crossfire. Again, it seemed every innocent person was dragged into his mess. They were caught in the crossfire. Even as Spider-Man tried to save her life, it didn't work. She was yet another one of the fallen. The courthouse collapsed around him as he held the dying judge, who got crushed by the rubble. He did everything he could to bring her back, but all she did was flutter, her eyes open, and let out a sharp breath. You're not guilty, she whispered. Her voice, hitching, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And then, she was gone. Peter watched as her eyes drained themselves of any color. More rubble fell and crashed against the ground, crushing the cameras as the journalists rushed away. However, there was no hope. There were explosions outside, bombings. Peter recognized the sound, although he wished he didn't. He carried the judge's body to safety, then went to the front to see the protesters were bombed. There was a screech of laughter that echoed across the walls of Peter's mind. He heard the wind brushing, but despite the snowstorm clashing through the air, he saw an eerily familiar suit as the snow passed and cleared his vision. There was smoke clogging the area, Peter choking on it as he squinted to spot the single man on a glider. His suit was a mesh of orange and blush, a goblin-like face with glowing red eyes, and a glider with a skull on the front of it. It looked like bat wings stretched out from the sides of the skull, keeping him hovering in the air as he laughed at Spider-Man. Who are you, Spider-Man asked, in a show to prang his voice didn't strain. The man laughed and threw another bomb at the few surviving protesters. Peter reached out with his webs and grabbed it, flying it back at the goblin, only for him to dodge. 
the bomb exploded and rocked the earth. Peter wobbled, but managed to stay grounded. Hobgoblin was the man's response. As he came closer to the ground, he dashed at Peter, but he sidestepped and darted away. Hobgoblin grunted and went back in for another attack. Peter kept dodging. He had seen that fighting style before, as if the name wasn't enough of a giveaway. Now the suit and the fighting style, it was yet another goblin that Peter had to face. But how did this keep popping up? Why was this a recurring theme in his life? The thought of Harry hit the back of Peter's mind, but he had to force it down to instead go after the hobgoblin. The laughing villain ducked and dived on his glider. More bombs launched in the air towards both Spider-Man and the protesters. Spider-Man managed to protect them, but the fight kept wearing him down more and more. Spider-Man hopped up and kicked Hobgoblin off of his glider. Now it was a fair fight. The two went back and forth. Punches and kicks were exchanged, with Spider-Man taking the lead. He was winning. But all that changed when Spider-Man stumbled over the snow. Hobgoblin took the upper hand. What was once a win for Spider-Man became an easy win for Hobgoblin. Spider-Man was punched, kicked, and scratched more times than he could count. Wrath flooded inside Peter's veins as he yelled, rage overtaking him, until all he saw was red. Seeing the goblin suit unlocked a new side of him, he didn't wish to feel. All he wanted was to see the new goblin dead. Peter wasn't sure if he was doing it for the people or himself, but the goblin had to die. Unfortunately, Peter didn't get his wish. Hobgoblin knocked him down and got on his glider. From there, Hobgoblin threw Peter inside the burning courthouse, stabbing his shoulder in the process. The courthouse was collapsing all around him as blood spilled on the floor. Hobgoblin watched as Peter lay on the ground, unmoving as more liquid freed itself from his body. Hobgoblin threw a pack of pumpkin bombs at Peter. He barely got up in time to dive away, but the bombs still launched him back into a pillar. Hobgoblin laughed as he left, fleeing right before the pillar fell and trapped Peter inside. He coughed. He couldn't tell if blood or saliva was on his lips. His vision wavered in and out of focus. His body was going limp. Soon enough, he closed his eyes, unable to bear the pain his body was in. As his shoulders kept bleeding, Peter groaned. Everything hurt. His arms, his legs, his chest. The overwhelming aroma of smoke snapped him to his senses. He wasn't sure how long he was out for, but the numbness told him it had to have been at least a minute. He was still in the courthouse as it bursted into flames. Rubble surrounding him. If he dug up, there was a chance at survival. It was the best shot he had. With all of his strength he had left, he powered through the rubble. He brushed it aside, yelling out in agony as the rubble weighed down on him more, but he persevered. He came out on top, managing to get through the ruins and make his way to the surface. Peter almost threw up when he crawled to the familiar cracked, snowy sidewalk. The storm was picking up, the cool outside air contrasting the warmth of the fire that could have killed Peter. His suit was torn up, the top of his mask ripped, and allowing some of his dark locks to spring free. He had to get home as soon as possible, otherwise his identity would be revealed. That, or the Hobgoblin, would come back to finish him off. There were police outside, searching through the bodies to find any survivors. Peter got up and limped to get them, holding his injured shoulder. What happened? Where's the goblin? Peter asked, the policeman. Before him signing, we shot him down, but he was too fast. He escaped through the storm. Peter's stomach sunk inside of him as he nodded. Despite the concerns of the policeman, Peter left. He swung away and escaped into the storm. He shivered, but his body still felt warm. Not knowing what else to do, he sat on top of a roof. It was an apartment complex, one of the many in New York City. He laid down and shut his eyes before a minute, or more like 20. 
He let his body relax and heal his injuries, but he knew that he needed actual medical treatment, otherwise he'd die. He hadn't been this close to death in so long. The last time was with Venom, but Harry saved him from that. Although that wasn't a thought Peter wanted to have, he indulged in it for a second. Longer than he needed, he drank in the memory of his best friend, wondering what he would have said if he were here right now. Peter kept himself still, as he still fell into his memories, allowing Harry's face to appear in his mind. It was quiet. There were distant sirens and the blowing wind, but otherwise, it was just Peter and his thoughts. He grabbed his phone, which he was amazed survived the fight, and brought it to his ears. He called MJ, taking off of his mask, so he could suck in the freezing cold air. Peter, MJ's voice said after only two rings, MJ, I don't know what to do. The court hearing and the judge said I wasn't guilty, but this goblin showed up and bombed the place. It's another goblin. I have to stop him before it gets out of hand, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. You do, she said in a tone that soothed his ears. Please, Peter, trust me on this. You can do it. You'll stop him and protect the city like you always do. If you don't believe in yourself, at least believe in me. Peter sniffled, gripping the gravel beneath him to keep himself grounded in reality. Thank you. I'll see you when I can. Come back to me, Parker. You're not allowed to leave yet. He found himself laughing before he could stop himself. Wouldn't dream of it. MJ hung up first. Peter scrolling through his contacts to find Dr. Connors. It was past eight by now. It was strange, really. It seemed like the fight was a minute, but in reality, it took longer than Peter imagined. Time flew by as his shoulder bled and his body ached. Still, he managed to press on Dr. Connors' number and pressed the phone against his ear. Nothing, ring, 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 nothing. Dr. Connors never answered, and Peter stiffened. Where was he? But Peter had no time to worry about the dock. There was clamoring from below. Peter glancing down in time to see the remaining protesters getting into a brawl. It seemed as though they were split over whether it was Spider-Man's fault or not. The police were there, trying to separate them. Peter swung back and hit on top of a building next to the courthouse, listening in on the chaos. There was nothing he could do except watch as the police got it under control. Despite being called not guilty, despite the judge wanting to protect Spider-Man, Captain Stacy got assigned to take Spider-Man in. Peter's heart shattered in his chest as he gathered the courage to leave, deciding to leave the courthouse behind him. After all, what else could he do? The Oscorp lab was longer than it was the last time Roderick saw it. He kept making expansions to it, demanding more materials and asking for more space. His subordinates had no choice but to accept, as he hopped off his glider and limped his way to the middle of the laboratory. He saw Dr. Connors cowering in the corner with what seemed to be a serum in his hands. Roderick's face had become more like a goblin's, with long teeth and glowing eyes. He was grunting and groaning the entire way to the room, him smashing all of the important equipment to scare Dr. Connors further. The man was already trembling, begging Roderick not to hurt his family. Seeing as the scientist had what seemed to be a cure, Roderick's tactics were working. I'll prove this is the right serum, Dr. Connors said, his trembling hand holding up the vial, holding the precious liquid. I'll take it. To prove, watch. Don't hurt my family, please. I did what you asked. He indeed did take the serum. He injected himself with it, and Roderick watched the narrowed eyes. They waited. They waited and waited and waited. Roderick's impatience grew when nothing happened. Granted, Connors wasn't infected with what Roderick was, but he figured at least some change would happen. Connors was the same, and Roderick's fury boiled over and took control. Roderick charged forward and began choking Connors. The scientist was lifted up by his neck, him crawling at Roderick's hands to no avail. Roderick was much stronger than the feeble man. Roderick glanced, but then he noticed a spark in Connors eyes. No, actually it wasn't a spark. His eyes were turning green. Before Roderick could react, he was pushed back into the nearest wall. His glider got crushed under his weight, him glaring at Connors from across the way. Hobgoblin went to the weakened Connors and threw him on the ground, grabbing a bomb and rolling it next to him. Then, Hobgoblin left. 
Now, all that was left was the scientist's family. Peter, he didn't know what to do. Oscorp was his last chance at finding answers. So, that was where he went. After stopping at his apartment to patch up his shoulder wound, with the help of MJ, he took some painkillers and went out to find Dr. Connors. Now, he was entering the lab and was amazed to see it caught on fire. Equipment was destroyed. Hobgoblin's glider was crushed in the corner, and no sign of any serums were anywhere. All that was left was Dr. Connors' unconscious body, lying in the middle of the floor. Peter, overwhelmed from the chaos that had been that day, instinctively screamed for help. He didn't care that his voice sounded much too like Peter Parker's, despite him being Spider-Man now. He prayed and wished that somebody would come, but it seemed as though no one was around. Connors perked his head up at the sound of Peter's voice, beckoning him to come closer. Peter agreed, kneeling next to the man and listening to every word he had to say. My family, he's going after my family, Connors managed to say, his voice cracking over every syllable. Luckily, it seemed as though something went right that day. Peter heard voices outside, and soon enough, the police entered with Captain Stacy, front and center. Although Peter knew Captain Stacy was after him, it brought him consolation to know that at least Dr. Connors would be okay. And that was exactly what happened. Captain Stacy escorted them out of the burning building and took them to the cars outside. There were fire trucks zooming down the road to get there, and everyone was searching for the perpetrators of the crime. Everyone silently agreed that they knew who it was. Peter knew he was sure Dr. Connors knew, and the cops knew as well. In the course of just a few hours, everything had fallen apart. Peter was barely holding it together, especially when Captain Stacy approached him by one of the trucks, keeping one hand too close to his gun for Peter's liking. You know we need to talk, Captain Stacy said. Peter dipping his head in form of a nod. Listen, I don't know what the judge told you. I wasn't inside. But it seems like destruction follows you everywhere. Even if you're not guilty for at least some of it, it's best to keep you off the streets, yeah? Captain Stacy had handcuffs out, pointed at Spider-Man. Although he knew there were far more important matters, running away again would make him look even more guilty. A man's family is in danger. Please, you can arrest me. But please, his family. Dr. Connors, the man I brought out of that building. His family, they need help. Captain Stacy didn't wait for Peter to finish. He slapped the handcuffs on him and put him in the back of the truck. It was sturdy, almost as if they put him in here in hopes that it would tame his power. If Spider-Man wanted to break out, he was sure that he could. Still, he slumped back in the seat and signed, awaiting further notice from the police. A minute ticked by. Two. Three. Soon enough, Spider-Man's senses heightened. He felt goosebumps form on his arms and legs. It was quiet, yet it felt so loud. Everything clashed together in his mind until he could hear the faint laughter. Seconds later, an explosion went off. The truck flipped, Spider-Man going with it. He yelped as he collided with the ground, the windows shattering and glass flying everywhere. He was cut several times, tears forming in his already weak suit. His ears rung as he attempted to put himself back together, his vision blurry. He still heard the shouting outside. That was what caused him to snap to his senses. The handcuffs were weak around him, so he tore them off with what strength he had left. Then, he crawled out of the window and noticed the familiar face terrorizing the police. It was the Hobgoblin laughing and holding bombs. He had a different glider, an older model it seemed. Spider-Man got to his feet, limping and wobbling. The police were in danger. Captain Stacy was in danger. That adrenaline, that caused adrenaline to kick in. Spider-Man getting in front of Captain Stacy, just as Hobgoblin threw another bomb. Spider-Man grabbed it with his webs, launching it in the other direction. Back towards the fearsome foe, Hobgoblin laughed and ducked out of the way of the explosion. Grabbing Spider-Man by his chest, Spider-Man withered in the man's grasp, but it was inevitable. Spider-Man was pulled into the building next to Oscorp. It was much smaller, but still at risk of the fire due to how close it was. The inside was wide and free of civilians. Desks were overturned, almost as if this was an abandoned office building. Seeing as it was next to Oscorp, Spider-Man wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Peter heard the flames cracking outside. He heard the sirens. He was grateful the police didn't come in and try to intervene. 
By this point, they knew not to interfere with Spider-Man's battles. It would only result in more unnecessary death and destruction. You think you're a hero, the Hobgoblin said, his voice teetering between a rasp and a laugh. How many have died because of you? How many more will die because of you? What about the villains who rose? Would they have come if you never existed? If you never dared to flash your face on every billboard in Times Square? Protecting the people, Peter replied. But the words felt weak as they passed his lips. He could see Harry's face in the back of his mind. He curled his hands into fists. Without another word, the fight broke out. Peter used the large walls and high ceilings to his advantage. The windows were shattered with the light from the fire being the only light illuminating the space. Peter grabbed several pieces of glass and swung them towards the hobgoblin. He dodged again and again throwing more bombs to catch Peter off guard. With his new glider, Hobgoblin zoomed towards Peter. He hit his chest, sending Peter flying back into the wall. The thud sound his body made had Peter grunting, his vision fading in and out for a second or two longer. Hobgoblin hopped off of his glider and took a bomb, likely the finishing blow. Peter didn't allow that to happen. He stood, raising his hands and preparing to fight. However, his mask was too torn. He could barely see through all the fabric. Not knowing what else to do, Peter took off the restrictive mask, dropping it by his side to face down Hobgoblin. The goblin chuckled more, and the sound descended into a fit of chaotic laughter that echoed around the room. Peter held his ground, but his posture faltered when Hobgoblin took off his mask to reveal Roderick. Although part of Peter wasn't surprised due to the demand of the serum, it still made his heart twist and turn guilt crept up the back of his throat in the form of bile. But Peter managed to hold back. I wouldn't be here, Roderick said, circling around Peter. If it weren't for you, you killed my brother. You can say it was an accident all you want, but I watched you jump out of the way and dodge that bullet. The bullet that took away the last piece of my family that I had left. I'm so sorry, was all Peter could say, as moisture swelled up in his eyes. I never meant for this to happen. Peter, 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 Hobgoblin said, picking up his mask and making it a tisk sound with his tongue. I always thought you would change our company, Parker. What happened to you? It's too late, Roderick said, with a dismissive hand wave, throwing the mask back on and getting on his glider. Dr. Connors failed me. You failed me in too many ways to count. I made Connors a fair deal. The serum for his family. I don't have the serum. Maybe this will give him some new motivation. Before Peter could reply, Hobgoblin sped towards him. He was hit in the chest, flying backwards and going through the brick wall behind him. Peter yelled out in pain as he hit the outside ground. The sidewalk beneath him cracked and filled with moss. He was frozen on the ground, agony shooting through his veins. He was sure his shoulder wound reopened. There was blood all over him as he glanced up and saw the police trucks in the distance. The police attempted to fight Hobgoblin, but it was no use. He had bombs and he had used them to destroy the remaining trucks. Captain Stacy got out and Peter reached out his hand despite him being too far away to help. The police captain shot at Hobgoblin. He was no match. Hobgoblin laughed as he pulled out an army Swiss knife and threw it into the captain's chest. It sunk into him. What Peter imagined was his heart. All he could do was watch as Captain Stacy fell over, the light fading from his eyes. For what felt like the millennialth time, Peter was helpless. Dr. Connors woke up in the chaos. He was in an abandoned truck that was parked on the curb across the street from the burning Oscorp facility. All the other trucks were on fire or worse. A row of corpses lining the street. They were all police officers. Surprisingly, Connors felt okay. His neck was stiff and sore, but his body was ready to move. He got up and was amazed to see the doors of the truck were unlocked. He fell out, grunting when his knees skimmed across the concrete ground. More sirens were wailing in the distance, and the rising moon was blinded by the howling flames behind him. Not knowing what else to do, Connors left the scene. Roderick was after his family, so that was his priority. He dashed down the street, not caring that to the civilians. He looked like a manic. His eyes were bulging and his hair frizzed. His lab coat was torn enough for him to decide to shred it from his body, revealing the white scrubs he had underneath. It took five minutes of constant running until he reached home. There were no flames, but arguably something worse was waiting for him. 
Hobgoblin. The glider was floating next to him. Connors' wife and son were being held captive by the monster across from him. With his head, the goblin motioned to the bridge in the distance. I'm going to take your family on a tour of the city. If this is your last chance, meet me at the bridge in 20 minutes with the serum. Otherwise, your family. Goblin trailed off and laughed, as if that showed his point. He held Connors' wife and son in his arms. As he got back on his glider, and flew away. Connors tried to stop him but they were already gone. They soar into the night sky, and Connors could only watch. His heart fell into the soles of his feet as he staggered back. 20 minutes, that was all he had left. 20 minutes until his family would die. Peter had a trail of blood behind him. After wrapping torn fabric around his face to hide his identity, Peter left the fight scene behind. He had to get to Connors before Hobgoblin did, but there was one issue. Peter was powerless in front of Goblin. If he were to survive, he needed gear, better protection, time to think of strategies. That led him to the place he didn't want to go back to, Harry's house. He limped there as crimson liquid stained the snow beneath his feet. It was cold, yet Peter didn't feel it. There was a strange sense of warmth hugging his body as he entered the abandoned house. It was even emptier than Peter remembered it. No noises were there except the sound of Peter's footsteps pressing against the creaking wooden floorboards. The walls were cracked, no lights on. Only the dim moonlight peeked through the window lit the path Peter had to take. There were sheets covering what used to be Harry and Norman's belongings. There were old pictures and masks lingering around the space. Although there was little furniture, there was a tiny couch in the corner with a basketball on it. Peter chuckled as he approached, taking off what was left of his mask to get a better look at it. He held up the basketball, rubbing over the surface of the rotten item. There was a cracked mirror next to him, reflecting some of the moonlight. It shined on Peter's face, highlighting the texture of the ball in his grasp. I remember when you couldn't get in the basket, Peter said. His voice was merely a whisper, floating in the air and swirling around the isolated space. It was quiet. There were crickets outside, chirping away. Occasionally, he heard a bird squawk. Then, he heard something else. A small laugh, and it came from the mirror. Peter tilted his head towards the disturbance, and what he saw had his eyes nearly bursting free from their sockets. Harry. He was in the reflection, parts of his body missing due to the cracks in the mirror. Peter still held the basketball as he rushed over, halting in front of the distorted Harry and giving him a grin. Hey buddy, how are you? Harry asked. Peter's mouth opening and shutting as he contemplated on what to say. Harry was all he could come up with. He choked over the single word, rubbing his fingers over the basketball and begging no tears would come. I know how you're feeling, Pete. I've been there before. You're lost and confused. Everyone is counting on me, Peter said, his voice stumbling over itself. I can't do it alone. I can't beat him. He's too strong. You're stronger, Harry replied. The two words spiraling around Peter's mind until he felt dizzy. You're not alone. No matter what battle you're in, you have us by your side. You always have a choice, Pete. Peter nodded with tears clouding his eyes. He couldn't handle staring at the face of his former friend, so he glanced at the ball. It was silent. Crickets replaced what used to be Harry's soothing voice. And when Peter peeked up again, Harry was gone. The reflection was gone. He put the ball back where it belonged and stepped away from the mirror. Moving his gaze to the entrance to the goblin lair, his hand wrapping around the knob to the glass door, but he was halted by another presence. Don't go in there, sir. Peter whipped around, dropping his hand. Bernard. The man kept staring at Peter until he lowered his head, stepping away from the lair and leaving it behind. He went to the couch and sat, being sure to stay away from the basketball. Bernard did the same, but he stood before Peter, keeping his hands folded in front of him. I don't know how to beat him. He's more powerful than anything I've ever faced before. How am I supposed to do that? I've watched you take down worse than this, Bernard said, with a soft smile that tugged on the corners of his lips. I won't lie to you. The fight won't be easy, but you'll manage. How? My mask is pretty much destroyed. My shoulder is stiff, and my back feels like it'll break at any moment. It's Roderick. Roderick's the hobgoblin. That makes no sense either. How did he? Norman has a secret lair underground. It's an Oscorp. Extra suits, masks, gliders. That's the only explanation. You fought so hard to get here, Peter. Please don't give up. Not yet. Peter set his jaw, considering Bernard's words. Then he nodded. 
Okay, I'll beat the goblin once and for all. After, he took his mask and left. He searched for Connors, finding him outside of his house in the cold. He was distraught, his whole body trembling while his eyes were wide. Peter took him inside, rubbing his arms to warm him up. He took my family, Connors muttered, repeating the words like a mantra. We need the serum. He took them to the Brooklyn Bridge. If we don't have the serum soon, he'll... We'll get the serum. Do you have a lab here? Connors gave a half nod and led Peter to the basement, where there was indeed a lab. It was much smaller than the one at Oscorp, but it would do the trick. It was dirtier. Chemicals left out of the lab, coats thrown all over the place. We can fix Roderick, okay? Let's work together quickly. Peter said, taking off his torn mask. Connors kept to himself, staying quiet and focused as he worked on the serum. Together, the two looked over all their notes, reading through each line carefully, until they came across the conclusion that they had to risk it all. They didn't have the time for testing and experimenting. So, they made a formula and went with it. It was the best solution they had in the limited time frame Goblin gave them. By the time they were done, Peter grabbed the serum and Connors and swung to the bridge. He had his mask on now, but it didn't seem like it was doing much anymore. His left eye was showing, as was his chin. They arrived in two minutes, spotting Hobgoblin on the bridge with Connors' wife and son. There were cars on the bridge, but due to Hobgoblin's presence, the bridge was shut down with police trying to defuse the hostage situation. It was Peter's turn. No more being helpless. No more watching as people died. Peter approached and kept Connors behind him, instructing him to stay back no matter what. Connors was reluctant to agree, but Peter's stern tone warned him that he could handle it. He had the serum in his grasp, Hobgoblin eyeing it and keeping the wife and son behind him. His glider was hovering by his side, him hopping on it and coming a bit closer. The serum first, Hobgoblin said, holding out his hand. Peter tiptoed closer, about to drop the serum in Goblin's hand, when a spider sense went off, but it was too late. Hobgoblin threw Peter into Connors, who yelped and went flying back. His body spasmed, his eyes turning green. Peter wanted to rush to see if he was okay, but the serum was about to fall off of the bridge with his webs. He grabbed it and brought it back, but Hobgoblin was already on the move. He was grabbing bombs and preparing to destroy the bridge and the people on it. The police were shouting and trying to get the remaining citizens off the bridge. Peter joined, zipping by and saving everyone he could, everyone in his view. He grabbed them and swung them to safety. Connors was still spasming on the floor, Peter about to go next to him when Hobgoblin smashed into his chest. Peter gasped for air as he hit the ground, Hobgoblin hovering between him and Connors. The serum was still in Peter's grasp. All he had to do was cure Goblin. Then, the bridge would be safe. But with all of the bombs at Goblin's disposal, it was risky. By trying too close the distance, Peter risked so many innocent lives. Most of the civilians were off of the bridge, thanks to Peter, but the police were still there, helping Connors' wife and son. Connors was scratching at the concrete of the bridge. His body was shaking. Hobgoblin stayed where he was, as if begging Peter to do something, to make a move. So, Peter did. He swung towards Hobgoblin to fight, the two clashing midair and exchanging blows. One punch hit Peter, then one hit Hobgoblin, then another on Peter, and it went back and forth until Peter managed to get Hobgoblin off of his glider. The serum was in his hand, and he maneuvered it, so he was in firing position. While Hobgoblin was down, Peter took the opportunity, injecting it into the man's neck. He cried out and knocked Peter back. He fell to the ground, hitting his head off of the concrete. Peter lost consciousness for a bit. It was as if he fainted his vision going black for what seemed like a second, but it could have been minutes. When he came to, he saw Connors was still on the ground, but Hobgoblin was nowhere to be seen. Peter crawled to Connors, but he was too busy pulling at his hair and begging it to stop. Peter had no idea what it was, so he shook the scientist. Just go, he said, his voice lower than it had ever been before. Save my family. Peter did what he was told. He helped the police get Connors' wife and son inside of a vehicle that sped away. Peter watched it until it was off the bridge. Police were crowding around Connors now, but he seemed reluctant to go with them. Peter realized Hobgoblin was still on the move and decided to leave. The police handled Connors, so Peter would handle Hobgoblin. He swung off the bridge and went through the city. There were no signs of Hobgoblin anywhere, not knowing 
what else to do. Peter decided to check on MJ, seeing as Roderick knew Peter's identity and was his boss. He knew where Peter lived. That meant MJ could be in danger. Whether or not Roderick would think this far ahead was unclear, but it was better to be safe than sorry. When Peter arrived at his apartment, he found it trashed. His stomach plummeted to the ground as he stepped inside. Their kitchen was a mess with the fridge door opened, the Christmas tree destroyed, with the gifts stomped on and laid across the floor. Peter trembled as he quietly searched for MJ. He didn't call out her name. Instead, he looked through each room. She wasn't there. Roderick took her. The serum didn't work. They failed. And now MJ was caught in a crossfire. Peter didn't have time to sit and reflect on those thoughts. He had to stay strong. Where would he have taken MJ? This wasn't like a hostage situation in return for someone else's. Roderick took MJ so he could kill her, probably slowly, brutally, just to punish Spider-Man more. Roderick didn't know that Peter knew about the secret goblin lair in Oscorp. Although the building was mostly destroyed due to Hobgoblin's carelessness, the underground would probably remain intact. That was Peter's only lead, so he went with it. He swung through the city, and he wondered if this night would ever end. It seemed as though things kept piling on and on, never ending, until Peter would never recover. The adrenaline masked most of his pain and panic. But since he was out of the fight, he got a chance to feel his shoulder, expanding and contrasting. His arm was in agony that shot like little spikes of pain to the sides of his body. His mouth smelt of blood, the familiar copper taste flooding his taste buds. It didn't help that the rest of his figure was covered in moisture. He couldn't tell if it was blood, melted snow, sweat, or something else entirely. Peter made it to Oscorp and found it was blocked off by police tape. There weren't any police there, currently, but their presence was still known. Captain Stacy's body had been moved, and Peter signed. He had no choice but to go in what was left of Oscorp. The outside seemed normal, all things considered. However, he could see from his position across the street that the interior had been burned to nothing. He entered, and that theory was confirmed. There was nothing left except scorch marks and the smell of smoke. It clogged his nostrils until they cried, Peter ignoring it too, instead searching for the underground lair. The rubble covered most of the ground. Peter had to take his time despite him not wanting to. He searched every door, every crack in the floor, every bump in the wall. Still, he found nothing. Don't give up, was what Bernard said. Peter groaned and got back to work, finding a door in the corner and going inside. It wasn't the lair, it was a laboratory that looked a bit like Dr. Connors' home lab. There were chemicals all over the place, lab coats out. This seemed like the only place unaffected by the fire. Peter searched the space, noticing how the walls were thicker, like they were designed to withstand a lot of the outside force. There was another room in the corner. Peter going inside and realizing it was the closet. There were lab coats hung up, disinfecting chemicals everywhere on the shelves. However, that wasn't all. There was a laundry bin covering a spot on the floor. Peter tilted his head and moved to the bin, noticing a dent in the floor. He traced his hand along it until he felt a handle. Then he pulled up the hatch. After countless minutes of searching, he finally found it. He held back a smile and went down the ladder into the secret lair. When his feet hit the ground, he heard voices in the distance. He didn't hear MJ's, but he heard goblins. The man's voice was loud and obnoxious, laughter following most of his sentences. This was Peter's chance. He could ambush Goblin and take him out. So that's what he did. He hid in the shadows. It was a dark lair that had little lighting. Only small bulbs, half of which out due to the years of abandonment. He saw MJ was strapped to a table, Goblin hovering over her and holding a tray of various instruments. Peter's theory was correct. A slow and painful death to destroy Peter Parker. It made him sick, but at least he knew he still had time to plan his attack. There were vents in the ceiling, extra suits and gliders in the corner of the room. 
checkered floors with goblin masks covering the black and white patterns. Peter stuck to the wall and crawled to the ceiling, slipping inside the nearest vent entrance. He was still a good 30 feet away from the goblin. He went as quickly as he could, making sure he didn't make a peep or accidentally cause the vent to shake. He stopped when he was directly above goblin. The exit to the vent before him, all he had to do was kick it down and the panel would land on Goblin's head. Peter lined up the shot. Just as Goblin went to start the process, Peter rushed into action. The panel launched down and smashed against Hobgoblin's head. He shouted and backing away from MJ, Peter jumped down and that was when Hobgoblin grabbed a remote from the tray and pressed on the giant red button. He laughed as the chamber began to flash in a sea of scarlet emergency lights. What did you do? Peter asked, not hiding the horror in his voice. I wasn't sure if you would track me or not, Roderick said, placing the remote back down. I wanted to take my time with your lovely friend, but you always have a backup plan, don't you think? Two minutes, Peter. Tick tock. That was when Peter realized the place was rigged to explode. Two minutes to defeat the Hobgoblin and get MJ out of there and far enough to keep them both safe. His heart pounded, his throat as he got into a ready stance, preparing his webs to fire. If Connors hadn't already exposed me to the police, Roderick said, pausing to laugh. I'm sure he will. That is if the government doesn't recognize my flight gear first. There's no reason to keep going. All I want to see is you suffer, like you made me suffer. I'm taking you to hell with me, Spider-Man. And then they fought. A fist fight broke out. MJ watched in horror as Peter ducked and dodged as many attacks as he could. He got punched in the face, leading him to stagger and almost fall over. Hobgoblin was fast and aggressive. Each punch was harder than the last. He was worse than any goblin Peter had ever faced in his life. Hobgoblin was jumping and laughing throughout it all, and even when Peter did manage to land a punch, the goblin only grinned wider. They went back and forth until Hobgoblin knocked Peter back. His wrist got caught under one of the gliders, him groaning and trying to free it. Hobgoblin grabbed a pumpkin bomb and approached as the timer clicked down. See in hell, Spider-Man, Hobgoblin said as the goblin dropped to his feet. Hobgoblin laughed louder than he had before. Watching as the bomb ticked down, Peter broke his wrist to free it, and he jumped to the table, knocking it over to protect both him and MJ. Hobgoblin, realizing what just happened, screamed as soon as the bomb went off. Everything went white for a moment. Peter had no sense of direction. As he snapped back to himself, the chamber was flashing, a scream sounding off in the corner of the room. The timer was nearing the end signaling that the chamber was about to explode. Peter grabbed the tray that got knocked over, stealing the scalpel and freeing MJ from the table. She was trembling and saying something to Peter, but he couldn't hear it. He was too weak. Besides, he was trapped under yet another glider. His wrist was broken, his shoulder bleeding, and his mask completely torn from the fight. His face was on full display, MJ's crying eyes staring back at him. Get out of here, please, he muttered. Glancing at the door and seeing Roderick was near it, Peter almost threw up. Roderick's legs were gone, and he was howling about his pain, withering around. Eventually, he passed out, either due to the shock, stress, blood loss, or a mix of all three. I can't leave you, MJ said. But one look at Peter told her all she needed to know. She hesitated, but still decided to agree. She kissed his cheek as the water flooded the floor. It was coming from both below and above them, meaning the water pipes were shattered. Soon enough, the room would be flooded with water. Go save Roderick, not me. We'll all die if you try to help. Although MJ wanted to fight, she didn't. Goodbye, Peter, she said through her tears, getting up and dragging the unconscious Roderick out. The timer kept clicking down, Peter shutting his eyes. There was less than a minute left. Hell, less than 30 seconds. The water soaked his suit until he was flooding. Soon enough, he would drown if he wasn't blown up first. The glider was still holding him down. His best hope was that the water would cause it to float a bit, giving Peter room to escape. He kept his eyes shut as he listened to the rush of water entering the room and the click of the timer. Time slowed and Peter heard a voice. It reached out to him through the darkness and then he saw the face of Ben. Peter almost cried at the sight of his face, the man's soft, kind smile. 
causing Peter's heart to ease, even if it was just for a second. Are you ready to come home and see me? Ben asked, his voice dancing around the corners of Peter's mind. Peter then saw Harry's face, Otto's, all the faces of the ones he had lost. Then he saw Dr. Connors, MJ, Roderick, the ones he hadn't lost yet. Even if Roderick would always stay the same, Peter rubbed his lips together and let out a breath as the water lifted the glider. With great power, there must also come great responsibility, Peter whispered. As the faces faded away, the water flooded the area, Peter using his working hand to web anything he could. He tried pulling and pulling, but it was no use. As the water engulfed him, he realized he was helpless. Peter still didn't give up. He thrashed until he got out from under the glider. The countdown was seconds away from hitting zero. He kept swimming up, reaching out as if MJ was there to guide him. However, instead of MJ's hand, he saw a green one, a large green one. It had scales, claws, and it looked disoriented thanks to the water. Not knowing what else to do, Peter took the hand. He was pulled out of the water by the giant lizard, who took him and hopped away. As the timer hit zero, Peter let out a breath and lost consciousness. Peter finally came to. He groaned and held his throbbing head, realizing he was lying on something. It felt like a platform. Peter nudged the side of his head until he regained focus. He shook himself back into reality, glancing around and seeing he was above what was left of the lair. It was destroyed by the water and the explosion. It seemed as though nothing was left. Oscorp was a mess. In the distance, he heard voices. He was guessing the noises caused the people to come. That or MJ calling the police for help. He wasn't sure which, but that meant he'd have to deal with the public. When he glanced around, he saw no one was there. That lizard wasn't there. But Peter didn't need to see him to know who it was. It had to be Connors. Based on the way he was acting earlier, it had to be him. That and the green eyes gave it away. Peter sat up despite the searing pain in his body. He webbed up his shoulder, glancing down at what was left of the lair. There was a single half-broken goblin mask floating in the water. It shined in the water but it was barely visible due to the darkness of the room. Peter stared at it, a soft smile coming to his face when he realized it was over. The night he longed to end had finally ended, and all that was left was facing the crowds. Spider-Man got up and left the goblin behind. He didn't have his mask, so he tore off pieces of his suit and wrapped it around his face. It resembled his old mask, more than his new one, but it did the job. His eyes were visible, but he didn't care. He didn't have the strength to care anymore, not after what he went through. The public was out there, standing before him. It was divided. Half of them were on Spider-Man's side, while the other half wasn't. They were fighting. MJ was there, Roderick nowhere to be seen. Thanks to the police's presence, she cried when she saw that he was okay. Her body locked in place as she stared at him. He stared back, giving her a small nod as he limped to the front of it all. The crowd was roaring, Spider-Man holding up his hands as if that would diffuse the tension. Stop fighting, Spider-Man yelled, loudly enough to be heard. Some of them dialed down, others didn't. It took a full minute of people mumbling about how Spider-Man was there for them to calm down. We can't keep being divided like this, Spider-Man said, lowering his hands and sucking in a deep breath. Harry Osborn died for me. He sacrificed himself to save me. Venom was the one who killed him. And now Venom is gone. Hobgoblin killed all those people. But now he's gone too. The police have him. He'll never hurt anyone again. That innocent civilian who died was Hobgoblin's brother. And I'm so sorry for causing so much pain. I'm so sorry for all the suffering that had happened in this city. But I promise that all I've ever wanted to do was to protect you. Maybe that promise isn't enough. But I hope maybe one day you can forgive me. I know so many have died because of the villains and criminals I was too weak to stop, or the ones I couldn't get to in time. I'm so sorry. There's nothing else I can say except I'm sorry. It was quiet. Some snow hit the ground, brushing by the group of people. More silence came, Peter considering closing his eyes to await the verdict. It took one full minute. Then the verdict came. My friend was being robbed, a man said, stepping forward and clearing his throat. Robbed at gunpoint, he would have died. Spider-Man stopped that from happening. I was on a bridge, another, a woman said. He got me out before that goblin thing bombed the place. 
My family watched Spider-Man fight that Venom thing, another woman said, holding her hand against her heart. He saved the whole city tonight, too. More and more voices chimed in with stories. They ranged from small crimes to large ones. Eventually, the entire crowd was talking about how the lives who were saved thanks to Spider-Man. Even the anti-Spider-Man crowd realized how many they knew that were saved thanks to Spider-Man. The snow picked up, causing the crowd to cease their stories. Spider-Man limped forward as they decided to sing instead. Christmas songs filled the air. Some of them in sync, others not. Spider-Man kept going as MJ joined in on the singing. The lights of the city illuminating the united crowd. There were billboard advertisements, some news stations, however. The singing stopped when the Daily Bugle played on one of the nearest screens. The volume was on, and Spider-Man heard words he never thought he'd hear. Hobgoblin was a menace to society. He bombed bridges, buildings, people. He would have destroyed the city, but Spider-Man stopped it. I never thought I'd say this, but Spider-Man is a hero. He saved us. Applause broke out, MJ leading the charge, and even bouncing up and down with laughter, tears streaming down her face. Spider-Man gave the crowd one last nod before he swung away, smiling from the joy of it all. Finally, Peter wasn't helpless anymore. Christmas dinner was one of Peter's favorite times. It was nighttime, and he was with Aunt May and MJ. The house was decorated for Christmas, and it looked much better than Peter and MJ's apartment. They didn't get much of a chance to clean up, so they were celebrating with May as they loved to do. Peter got a letter. It only had Peter on the front. Nothing else. Figuring he had a long night ahead, Peter set it down and decided to open it later. Family first, random letters later. He grinned as he went back to the table and sat, digging into the feast as May and MJ laughed up a storm. They were talking about how MJ and Peter's Christmas shopping went, telling stories about how Peter mixed up the different shades of blue. He found himself laughing with them, throwing in comments about how he was no artist. The past few days have been chaotic, to say the least, but he still had this dinner that kept him going through it all. Oscorp or whatever was left of it now, was given to Peter, surprisingly. Bernard made sure Peter got Oscorp and all of its assets. He could make the decision if he wanted to run it or shut it down for good. Peter wasn't sure what to do, so he decided to make the decision later. Christmas was far more important. The Bugle was more supportive of Spider-Man than Peter could have ever imagined. They were praising him for stopping Hobgoblin, who was awaiting trial after getting treatment for his legs. Peter hoped that he'd never have to see him again. Dennis Carradine made a full recovery from his heart attack, and he was also awaiting trial. Peter wasn't sure if he should try and find out more than that, so he decided to focus on himself instead. Peter, May said, snapping him out of his thoughts. He nodded and he swallowed what was left of his mashed potatoes in his mouth. The creamy, salty taste flooded his mouth until he wished he could shove the rest of his plate down his throat. Everything smelled and looked amazing. It smelled and looked like home, which was the most Peter could ever ask for. May had a box, and she handed it to him. I made this for you, dear. Peter kept his grin as he took it, carefully opening the box with little Christmas trees decorating the wrapping paper. What was inside was another white container, covering the gift. Peter lifted it. As soon as he did, his jaw dropped. What awaited him was a red and blue fabric. The mask staring back at him was similar to the one he had for years. In fact, it seemed identical. Everything was perfect, the little Sue's trying the suit together tightly, so it would take a lot of damage to make it tear. It was another Spider-Man suit, only better because of who made it. Peter had tears in his eyes as he considered what he should say. He squeezed the suit, bringing it closer to his chest as he peered up at May. MJ had the same reaction as him, her holding her hands over her mouth to hide her awe. You knew, Peter whispered, a single tear falling down his face. May smiled, placing a hand on his shoulder. I always knew, Peter, she replied, giving him a small laugh. Merry Christmas. 
Christmas Day was just as lovely as he remembered. Peter was standing in the familiar cemetery as snow came down around him. It covered the dirt and grass, Peter's beat up sneakers making footsteps appear as he went inside. There was a light breeze that smelled of rain, water droplets hitting the top of Peter's head. He tucked his left hand into his jacket's pocket as he approached the first grave. His right hand held three roses, keeping them close to him. He glanced over the three graves that were close to each other. One was in the corner, the other was in the middle, and the last one was only a few spots away from where Peter stood now. He waited, closing his eyes and allowing himself to fall into his thoughts. More snow came and covered his body. His uncovered hand was cold but it felt right. He let himself feel cold. Before, all he felt was warmth, thanks to the adrenaline. Although his body still ached from the fighting he did, he was glad he got a chance to enjoy the winter, to enjoy the Christmas day. When he opened up his eyes again, he saw the grave of Ben staring back. He kneeled, placing a rose on the top of a snow-covered grave. He removed his hand from his pocket, and rested it on the side of the headstone. He waited as if that would bring Ben's voice back to him. It didn't, but he pretended it did. He indulged his Christmas wish for a second longer than he should have, but he was so grateful that he did. Peter moved to the next grave, placing the rose there, Otto Octavius. Peter remembered like it happened an hour ago. He could see Otto's face in his mind. He deserved to be remembered. If not for who he was, then for the sacrifice that he made. Peter made sure to steal another greedy second to linger by Otto's grave. Then he went to the last one in the corner. The rose placed itself on the top of the snow, Peter putting both his hands in his pockets to protect them. His eyes fell to the name carved on the headstone, his lips twitching up into a soft smile, Harry Osborne. Peter chuckled giving his gaze on the stone. He stole more greedy seconds, lingering for longer than he had time for. Christmas was a popular day for crime. People were more vulnerable during the holiday season. It was time to go and protect the city. They were on his side now, and Peter couldn't ask for anything more. He grabbed his mask from his pocket and put it on, shredding off his clothes to reveal the new suit underneath. He went to the alleyway next to the cemetery, storing his clothes inside the backpack. He had webbed in the corner. The people were relying on him. Peter knew he was needed. Spider-Man was the protector of the people. All that was left was embracing it. So he swung away. And that is going to be it for the If I Had Written Spider-Man 4. What did you think if I had written Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4? Now, a lot of people have always requested me to do this as a what if, and I knew from the very beginning, from like four years ago now, since like, what if I did, what if Green Goblin killed Spider-Man, I always knew that I was going to do this, but it was going to be done in such a way that it, it, it had to be its own thing. It couldn't be just a what if. It had to be way bigger than that because this is Spider-Man 4 we're talking about. The iconic project that never happened due to Sony and Sam Raimi and there was so much. And I think a lot of people really wanted me to do the Spider-Man 4 what if. And I was like, you know, it needs to be different. It needs to be a lot better. So I rebranded it into If I Had Written. Now, If I Had Written will be a series where I'll be taking all of the pop culture, cancelled stuff, as well as the new releases, and making my own version.